Our, ne our next speaker is Dr. Gypsy Amber de Souza, Associate Professor at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Her primary research interest is in interactions uh, causes of cancer, uh, infectious causes of cancer. Currently, her research explores the association between human papillomavirus, HPV, and oral, cervical, and anal cancers. Dr. De Souza has active research programs evaluating cancer screening methods and potential biomarkers for HPV. Please welcome Dr. De Souza. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm an epidemiologist, so a little bit different background um, than some of you, and it's so exciting to be part of the cross-disciplinary conversations. So a quick primer to HPV. It's a DNA virus. There's more than 100 different kinds of HPV distinguished based on differences in their genomes, but only 14 of those types are able to cause cancer, and a handful of them really cause the great burden of HPV-related cancers. So HPV can cause several different kinds of cancer. It's well known for its role in cervical cancer and vaginal cancer. It's also the primary cause of anal cancer and penile cancer. And about 10 years ago, we um, realized that HPV also causes oropharyngeal or tonsillar cancers. And in the US, it's now the main cause of those cancers. HPV also causes other um, diseases besides cancer, primarily genital warts and um, RRP. So if we think about the burden of cancers caused by HPV in the United States, in women, despite all the intensive cervical cancer screening, cervical cancer is still the main HPV-related cancer, um, with only a few thousand oropharyngeal cancers in women every year. But in men, uh, there are now almost as many new oropharyngeal cancer diagnoses each year in the U.S. Um, as there are cervical cancer cases in the U.S. So there's more than 10,000 new oropharyngeal cancers every year um, that are HPV-related. So I want to introduce you a little bit to the natural history of what we know about HPV infection in the mouth and throat and uh, the risk factors for HPV, and then what that means uh, in, a, in a dental office and around um, patient interaction. So we know that the oropharyngeal cancers that we care about um, are difficult to visualize, and they're in the um, tonsil and base of tongue, back of throat. Um, and so in people who are healthy and don't have lesions, the question is, how do we uh, test and evaluate these infections? So several ways have been done. Of course, in cancer patients, we look in the tumor and know whether it's HPV-related. But in everyone else who's healthy, you can look for HPV antibodies in blood, but that does not tell you where the HPV infection that you have antibodies to is. Is it cervical, anal, or oral? So it is not site-specific. Um, you can do swabs, but again, in people with no lesion, the detection rate is very low with, with swabs um, and any kind of focal sampling. Um, and so the best that we have is an oral rinse and gargle sample or a saliva collection test um, where we test for HPV DNA or RNA in that type of oral rinse and gargle. Now, we know this is not a perfect measure because if we look at people who have an HPV-related oropharyngeal cancer and we take an oral rinse and gargle and look for HPV DNA, we only detect it in around 70% of these cancer patients. Now, maybe the rest of them don't have sloughed off DNA from their tumor in their um, mouth and throat uh, to be detected by the test, but it is not a perfect test, but it is reproducible. If you look at the same person multiple days over time, the reproducibility is good. So this is the measure that we use. So looking at uh, HPV DNA detection in oral rinse samples in healthy people, in the general population, this is data from NHANES, which is a population sample. What do we see? Well, HPV, oral HPV infection, is fairly consistent across ages, around 8 to 14 percent in men, and around 2 to 4 percent of women have some kind of oral HPV infection, not necessarily the cancer-causing kind, but some kind of HPV DNA. So the first thing that stands out is it's more common in men than women. Um, and also that this is very strange for an STD. For an STD, you expect to see high rates in 20 and 30-year-olds who are out partying and low rates in 40 and 50-year-olds who do not party as much. But that is not what we see. Um, so there is something unusual and different about this STD compared to other STDs. This is not the pattern for anal or cervical HPV infection. 
When you look at oral HPV-16 specifically, so HPV-16 is the main con kind that causes cancer, especially in the oral pharynx, more than 90% of the HPV-related oropharyngeal cancers are caused just by HPV-16, so it is the dominant player. Um, what you see is this is not common. Prevalent infection with oral HPV-16, less than 1% of women, and we're talking 1% to 2.5% of men in the general population. So not that common. Now, there is a six-fold difference in the prevalence of oral HPV-16 infection between men and women. That's kind of commensurate with the differences we see in the cancer rates. So a question is why? Well, if we look at not just infection but also behavior, this is a risk triage tool um, that we just published uh, last year looking at how can we best classify people in the general population into risk groups to understand um, their oral HPV prevalence. And so the first differentiator is sex because men have much higher oral HPV prevalence than women. So if you look at women, the only other factor that really differentiated oral HPV prevalence was how many oral sex partners they'd had. People who had never performed oral sex or had only a single oral sex partner in their life had lower oral HPV uh, infection rates. Only 0.1% of them had uh, an oral HPV-16 prevalent infection. If you looked at women with two or more lifetime oral sex partners, they had a higher prevalence, but it's still very, very modest, very, very low. Um, now, if you look at men, uh, their oral HPV prevalence was differentiated by number of oral sexual partners and also by whether or not they currently smoke. So we see strong, consistent associations with current tobacco use, not ever tobacco use. The thought is that current use, there's uh, tobacco-induced inflammation that affects the likelihood of acquisition once exposed, whether or not you become infected and whether or not you clear infection because of some of that, of that tobacco-related inflammation. Um, so our highest risk group were men who had five or more lifetime oral sexual partners and smoked. In that group, 4% had a prevalent oral HPV-16 infection. So that's still not common, right, even in that highest risk group. But at any one time point, around 4% of men uh, in that group had uh, infection. It doesn't mean all men are at risk. You can see that there are men who do not have a lot of oral sexual partners, do not smoke, have very low oral HPV-16 prevalences. All right, well, so to put that prevalence data in contest, let's look at acquisition and at clearance. So when we look at the risk of acquiring a new oral HPV infection, what we see is that if you look at adult men, around 7% of them, when they're followed every uh, six months and you have an oral HPV uh, test and an oral rinse sample, 7% of them acquired some kind of oral HPV infection every year. Uh, these are adult men, and uh, it was a three-continent study. When you look at younger men, so more sexual partners, more sexually active, slightly higher rate, around 12% of them acquired a an, an new oral HPV infection every year. Uh, this was a study we performed in a Baltimore STD clinic for people who were being treated currently for STDs, so higher risk teenagers. You see higher rates of oral HPV acquisition, 24% of our teenage boys and 16% of our girls acquired a new oral HPV infection every year. So oral HPV is, infection is an STD. There's lots of acquisitions of some kind of infection, but again, remember, there's 100 different types of HPV infection. Only a few of those are, are oncogenic. So one of the things I'm asked all the time is, how likely is uh, someone in their life to get an oral HPV infection? And we don't have studies that are you know, more than three or four years of natural history. But if you look at the acquisition rates for a single year and extrapolate, um, uh, these are for any oral HPV infection, uh, and the oral HPV-16 rates are much lower at 0.8 to 3% per year. So if we think about lifetime risk of a becoming exposed to oral HPV-16, it's probably somewhere between 5 to 30% of men are exposed to oral HPV-16 in their life, and 1 to 8% of women are exposed to oral HPV-16 uh, in their life. Now, if you look at any oral HPV infection, it's going to be much higher. All right, uh, and here's some of the rates for oral HPV-16. You can see around 1% of men in the general population and 3% of our higher-risk men every year acquired a new oral HPV-16 infection. All right, so why? Why is oral HPV infection and incidence higher in men than women? 
Well, we performed a study uh, looking at sexual behavior to see can differences in sexual behavior explain the differences that we see. And in men, these are men we sampled every three months looking for oral HPV, new oral HPV infections. We saw the men who had recently had oral sex in the past three months were threefold more likely to acquire a new oral HPV infection. Exactly what you expect. That's the primary risk factor for acquisition. And the more partners you had had in the past three months, the more likely you were to acquire a new oral HPV infection. So this is, this is what we know and this is what we expect. It makes sense. When we looked in the women, there was no association <laughs> between sexual behavior, recent sexual behavior, and oral HPV acquisition. This is very strange. This is not what we expect. Now, we're looking at this in a group of women that are in an STD clinic, a group of men that are in an STD clinic. So these are already highly um, exposed individuals who have had many sexual partners and been exposed to STDs. Um, but still, this is very strange. So, there's two possible explanations. One is that it's not oral sex that matters. It's oral sex on a man or oral sex on a woman that matters. And the other explanation is that there's a difference in immune response to HPV. So we did have bisexual and homosexual individuals in this study, and we were able to look at that. So if we look at men who had performed oral sex on a woman, they had higher risk of a new oral HPV infection. Um, but when they performed oral sex on a man, it was not associated. So that suggests, okay, it's performing oral sex on a woman that matters. But if that was the case, you would expect the lesbians in our study to be at higher risk. And we did not see that. So this, this is a bit of a, um, it's unclear. I don't know what, what to make of it. Um, <laughs> so I can't give you a definitive answer, but to me, my guess, is that it suggests it is both who you perform oral sex on, because the uh, other evidence suggests that performing oral sex on the cervi cervical fluid has a higher HPV burden than the penile shaft, and therefore performing oral sex on a woman could have a higher risk of acquisition than on a man. So that is possible. At the same time, this also supports that there's an immunologic difference. So uh, women who have had a cervical HPV infection first uh, might mount a stronger HPV immune response than men who have had a penile HPV infection. And that stronger immune response in women than men could protect them from exposure when they're exposed to HPV orally. Um, that is not proven, again. That's a hypothesis. And if so, w these women who have already had STDs, already been exposed to cervical HPV infection, and are now having oral sex and being exposed, don't show the same risk level of infection as men. Um, so again, there are some clues in this natural history to why HPV infection, oral HPV infection and HPV-related orphaneal cancer is more common in men than women, but the story is not maybe as clean and clear as we would like to be able to communicate it uh, to, to our patients. Um, so we looked at behavior a few different ways. This was a study by Maura Gilson and Anil Chaturvedi and Anne Haynes looking at the per-partner risk of oral HPV infection. And the take-home here is if you compare men and women who have had the same number of lifetime oral sexual partners, men are more likely to have an oral HPV infection than women. Which means it is not just that men are having more partners. That does not explain the higher oral HPV prevalence in men than women. It is not completely explained by differences in sexual behavior, there is another piece. The per-partner risk is different. All right. So what I've shown you is about acquisition and risk factors for becoming infected. To make the story even more complicated, once infected with oral HPV infection, there is also a difference between men and women. So if we take people in our study who had oral HPV infections and follow them, both men and women are very likely to clear those infections within a year. In fact, within a year, more than half of the men and women in our study cleared their oral HPV infections. That's consistent with HPV natural history from other sites. People who have anal HPV infection, cervical HPV infection, most people clear infections within a year or two. Same thing for oral HPV infection. But you can see that 80 or 90% of the women cleared their infections compared to only 75% of the men. So men were more likely to have a persistent oral HPV infection than women. There's, an, again, support for the immunologic piece. So what did we just talk about? Well, oral HPV incidence, the risk of acquiring it, it's 
uh, not as high as other STDs like cervical HPV infection and anal HPV infection. It is not ubiquitous. Not everyone will be exposed to oral HPV-16 in their life. Um, but among those who do get infected, most people will clear those infections within a year or two, but not everyone. Men have a higher risk of acquiring an oral HPV infection and are less likely to clear it. Uh, and the differences we see between men and women are not fully explained by differences in sexual behavior. All right. So we wanted to look into this a little more. And so if we look at how likely men and women are to have ever performed oral sex in their life, most men and women, more than 80% in the US, perform oral sex at some point in their life. It's a common behavior. Now, men are more likely to have more partners. So there's you know, around a two-fold difference uh, in terms of having five or more lifetime oral sex partners in men than women. But that difference in sexual behavior, again, does not even come close to explaining the difference we see in oral HPV-16 infection. The difference that we see in infection, which is five or six-fold depending on the study, is commensurate with the difference that we see in the risk for oropharyngeal cancer. So why do men have more HPV-related oropharyngeal cancer? Because they have more oral HPV infection. Why do men have more oral HPV infection than women? That, again, is a harder piece. There's a part of it that's due to behavior, there's a part of it that's due to immunity, and there's a part of it that's due to higher risk from oral sex on a woman than a man. All right. Why is the rate of oropharyngeal cancer increasing? It is increasing dramatically by several percentage every year for the past uh, 15 years or so. And so people always ask, is this a generational change? Is this the baby boomers partying? And you know, is that why? Well, no, people have always had oral sex. It is more common than it was before, but the changes are modest. If we look at people in their 60s, around 75% of them ever performed oral sex. If you look at people who are 45 to 59, well, now instead of 75%, it's 80. Um, and if you look at people who are 30 to 44, it goes up slightly more to like 85%. So oral sex is more common now than it used to be, but the changes are not that dramatic. They do not fully explain what we're seeing um, uh, in the cancer, in differences in cancer, but they certainly have a role in explaining it. And there are diff other differences besides have you just ever performed oral sex. There are increases in the number of partners, and there's also increases in the order of sexual acts. Many more people are having oral sex at an earlier age, around sexual debut, and with more partners. And there is a real um, possibility in the literature that having oral sex early, having an HPV infection in your mouth as one of your first HPV infections instead of genital, may make that infection more likely um, to persist. So um, there, there is clearly a role for changes in sexual behavior by generation in the increasing uh, oropharyngeal cancer rates that we're seeing. So I wanted to also link um, the prevalences of oral HPV. Here I've shown how common it is just to have an oncogenic type or a cancer-causing type of HPV in your mouth uh, in the general population with cancer. So 6% of men have, at any one time point, a type of oncogenic oral HPV in their mouth, but less than 1% of men in the general population will ever develop oropharyngeal cancer. So the reason that I put this up is because oropharyngeal cancer is increasing, many of you will see people in your practice who have some concern. They've read an article about this. They're worried about their oropharyngeal cancer risk. Um, and we want our anxiety level to be commiserate with our risk level. So this is a cancer that is increasing, but we do not have any treatment to make HPV infection go away once you're infected. We have an HPV vaccine that can prevent you from becoming infected, but once you have an oral HPV infection, there is no therapy that we currently have. Um, so the risk level needs to be calculated with the fact that most people who have an infection will clear that infection on their own within a year or two without therapy, um, and that most people who have an oral HPV infection will not go on to develop cancer. However, there is a group that remains at higher cancer risk, and the longer your infection persists, the, the higher that risk is. So we're working on lots of studies trying to identify the best way to screen, the best biomarkers for persistence, but just having infection at any one time point, it is an important take home that that is not a good predictor for cancer risk because most people with infection will clear those infections. So what about risk in the next 20 years? 
Well, if we look at uh, the risk of orphaneal cancer in the next 20 years, you can see it is very low in men across all the ages. So again, a take home that immediate risk for people with no other risk factors in the general population, asymptomatic, no lesions, orphaneal cancer risk remains low. All right. Um, so I also want to touch on, um, I've covered our, our risk tool here, but I want to um, talk about some questions that come up. So should I offer saliva HPV testing to patients? Um, there are tests that are marketed that detect HPV DNA in the mouth. There's several important take homes here. One, there are no FDA approved diagnostic HPV screening tests, nothing that has been validated um, as clinically useful. Uh, at all. Um, and if you find someone who has oral HPV in their mouth, we have to think about the risk, uh, the benefit to harm ratio. So you now have told the person that they have a virus that can cause cancer in their mouth. There is no treatment to offer them at all. There is uh, no real screening. You can send them to a head and neck surgeon, but it is very dif difficult to visualize. The vast majority of times, they cannot see anything there, and the person has very high anxiety. Um, so for people in the general population with no other risk factors, testing for HPV is not recommended. Um, the ADA has a beautiful recommendation um, statement that came out last year uh, in JADA. It's called Evidence-Based Clinical Practice Guidelines for the Evaluation of Potentially Malignant Disorders of the Oral Cavity. As part of this, it included an evaluation of uh, ancillary tests, and the panel did not recommend any of the commercially available sal salivary adjuncts, uh, and that included the HPV DNA tests that are marketed, again, after complete evaluation of all of the literature, there was no uh, clear benefit. So I want to end by reviewing um, what we can do about HPV, because although there is no currently no effective treatment for someone who has uh, an HPV infection, there is uh, prevention for people who are not yet infected. So there are two HPV vaccines, um, an HPV2 vaccine called Cervarex, um, and an HPV-9 vaccine called Gardasil. In the U.S., really only Gardasil is used. Um, the U.S. Uh, ACIP recommends this Gardasil vaccine for all boys and girls in the targeted age ranges. 11 to 12 years old are where most people are getting this, but you can be vaccinated as young as nine. What we call catch-up vaccination, so for people who were missed, insurance will still pay for vaccination up to 21 years old in boys and 26 years old in girls. I'm asked a lot where these numbers came from. This is based on cost effectiveness. If there is a 30-year-old virgin, they can still have benefit from this vaccine, but on a population basis, most of us have had so many partners by 26 or 21, we've been infected. It doesn't pay for society to vaccinate you by that point because the chances that you haven't yet been exposed are low. So, um, and the other thing that we're asked about a lot is why are boys vaccinated? So girls are being vaccinated for the prevention of cervical cancer and anal cancer and genital warts. Boys are being vaccinated for the prevention of anal cancer and oral pharyngeal cancer and genital warts. All right, so boys are being vaccinated for their own personal benefit. The fact that if they are protected, they will not give HPV to their wives and they will not get cervical cancer is a wonderful side effect, but the, uh, their personal protection is the, is the main motivator. Um, when these vaccines originally went out, it was a three-dose regimen but studies show that you could get full immunity after two doses. So it is now a two-dose regimen since December 2016, two shots only. And if people are hesitant, you get a lot of benefit from even a single dose. So one is better than none. Um, uh, and our uptake has been low uh, to start, but we are now getting closer and closer to herd immunity, uh, especially in the targeted age ranges. Um, among older individuals, because when you are vaccinated in an older age, your immune response is not as good as when you are vaccinated at the young age, they are still recommending three doses. Thank you, and I look forward to questions uh, later in the panel.